Okay, let's look at this picture. Ah, uh, yes. If that makes you kind of crazy, it should. Because today, today in this letter to the city of Colossae, we're going to talk about the battle for the mind. And Paul's going to move into a real, a real straightforward attack, probably on Gnosticism, this heresy that was there, but really, really the heresy that tends to creep into our lives as well. And so he, when he starts into chapter 2, which is where we are today, he's really going to hit on this. This is what he's going to do. And he's going to introduce the topic of the battle for your minds today. And then for the rest of chapter 2, he's going to just get harder and harder on it. He's going to get deep on it. And he's going to address some really practical things that seep into our thinking, that steal us of our joy of salvation. So it's, it's really practical. This chapter 2 of Colossians is really all about how you need to be centered in Christ, and that is the preventative, but we're going to look at it more deeply. So really, it's a battle for your mind. And it's interesting, in Christianity, uh, what you think and what you know is key to everything. I mean, you cannot be a Christian and not be accurate in terms of what you believe. You have to be accurate in terms of what you believe. And we'll demonstrate why that is. So Paul's going to address this battle for the mind. And I've, I've split up the section for today into three sections. He'll start with really what our only foundation is. And of course, you probably know that's going to be Christ. And then he's going to go in and talk about the opposing fight that we see all the time. And he's not just talking about the Colossians. It's us too. There's a fight that's, that's there for your mind and what you believe. And then finally, what our ongoing focus has to be in the midst of this fight. So that's what we're going to look at. And this, again, this is just an intro to what he's going to talk about for the rest of Colossians 2 about this battle for your mind, what you believe. So let's start with this foundation. So he'll, he'll just jump into this. Verse 1, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who've not seen me face to face. And so this is how he starts this whole thing about the error that creeps into our lives and steals from us. He says, I'm sitting here in Rome and I'm struggling on your behalf because this is so key. Now, Paul's not doing this just because he wants you to know what's right, like an educator. He understands that this is a clear and present danger to your walk with Christ is what you know. So he's struggling for them on their behalf and for those he hasn't seen. And that's part of the struggle is that he didn't found the church there. He's not the one that, that brought the gospel to Colossae. Someone probably Epaphroditus did. So that's, that, that makes Paul that much more insecure in a sense. Like I, I haven't had a chance to do a personal appearance and tell them what's right and wrong. So here I sit in a jail in Rome just agonizing on your behalf. And he uses a really strong word for this. This word struggle up here. Uh, in the Greek, you'll love this, you know this word, it's the word agon, which is the beginning of the word agony, which made me think of uh, ABC Wide World of Sports. <laughs> you have to be old to know this because <laughs> yeah. ABC Wide World of Sports, I looked it up, stopped broadcasting in 1998, 20 years ago, just saying. But, but we use it there because this word literally in Greek means stadium. It doesn't mean agony as we know it. It means a stadium. It means a place where, where all these athletes come together and they battle one another, you know, like the Super Bowl. And, they, uh, and, back and, back. and so what goes on on the field in these athletic competitions is what this stadium word came to mean. It's when you look out from the stands, you look down there and you see the athletes competing and, uh, and just wrestling with each other, uh, all that kind of stuff. That idea is what the stadium where it had become. Agon went from being just a stadium to a place where people uh, do that kind of stuff. Okay, so that, that's why agon has come to mean agony for us, but literally it just means stadium. It really means stadium. So I, ha I, I had to look up the quote. You know this quote, right? Jim McKay would say this at the beginning of Wild World of Sports. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wild World of Sports. If you're old, you know those words exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and the agony part is the ski jumper who just kind of, <laughs> before he goes off, yeah, it's, yeah, right. Okay. So anyway, so that's agon. Agon, so Paul, Paul's trying to use a word that's really well known in the Greek culture when you have the Greek games, you know, the, the Olympics and stuff like that. These guys get down there and they just put their all into yeah, yeah, doing what they need to do. And that's what Paul is doing in his jail cell on behalf of the people in Colossae. He's like being an athlete contending yeah, yeah, for these people. 
So that's how important this topic is. He, he starts out this whole chapter telling him, this is super important. This engages me 24-7 like I'm an athlete in agony on your behalf. It's a big word. It's a, he, he doesn't just say a really wimpy word like, well, I'm kind of concerned for your well-being. No. It's <laughs> Think of two big sweaty sumo wrestlers. No, don't. That's kind of weird. But... But that's what he's saying. It's an, athletic, it's an athletic push he's doing on their behalf. That's what's going on here. Big words. And he says, for you, that's the people in Colossae, and for those in Laodicea. Now, I, I told you this a while ago, that Colossae is a, is a backwater, nowhere, tiny little town. It's, it, a lot of commentators say it's the most famous nowhere place in the New Testament. And it is. But it's next to some not-so-nowhere place. It's in a, it's in a tri-cities area, Colossae, and Laodicea and Heropolis, which will, that'll come up in the scriptures as well. And I promised you I'd show you where this is. So get ready. I'll show you where these places are right now. I hope you don't get emotion sick from stuff like this. But here we are over the eastern Mediterranean. And we're going to start moving until we fly into the west coast of present-day Turkey, what was called Asia Minor at the time. And you'll see a very familiar name, Ephesus. It was right on the coast right there. We're not going to go into Ephesus, but we'll stop here on the coast just for a second, and we'll follow this, this nice green valley on the right. That's the Lycus River Valley, one of the lushest places on earth. And we're going to go up that Lycus River Valley. You know, there's a lot of farms there to this day. It's really a luscious area. And way up into the center of present-day Turkey, there's that third city, Heropolis, which is on the north side of that valley, deep into the center of Turkey, and uh, actually very well known. If you go there today, there's a Roman Colosseum Stadium that's there to this day. And then across this river valley, uh, the Lycus River Valley, on the other side, on the southern side, there's Laodicea of, of fame, Ro- of Revelation 3. It was the last of the seven letters to the churches. Laodicea was the church that you was not warm or hot and you spew it out of your mouth and uh, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's Laodicea, a really famous Christian area. And then Colossae is, if you finish going up the river valley, there's our little Colossae at the foot of this mountain right here, a much more diminutive uh, village of the entire area, pretty much a nothing. But Laodicea was just eclipsed by Laodicea. And this is what frustrated Paul. Here's this little nowhere place out in the middle of nowhere, and he's in Rome. Well, how far away is Rome? Okay, put on your seatbelts if you get motion sick because we're going to go to Rome. There we are over the eastern Mediterranean. There's Greece going underneath of us. Coming up on the right is North Africa. And uh, there's Italy, the boot of Italy on the top left there. And there's Sicily. And then there's Rome right on that western side of of, uh, Italy. And there's Colossae way over there. You've got to jump over Greece and go into the middle of Turkey to find it. I mean, they're, they're really out in the middle of nowhere. So as we go back over the eastern Mediterranean, you can see why in Paul's voice he's... He struggles on their behalf because they are so far away and there's no way he's going to get out of jail and just go talk to him. So he's got to take all this, all this wrestling power this, this, that he's doing on their behalf and he has to channel that not into a personal visit but into the words you're going to read next. So that struggle, that struggle, that athletic struggle comes in the selection of the next words that he picks out in order to prevent them from going down for the battle of their mind. He's going to try and prevent their minds from being contaminated. So that's what he's going to do in these next words. So he says in verse 2, this is the struggle going on. I'm doing this that. And in fact, when you see that word that, he's telling you in that little tiny word that this is what drives me. I'm struggling on your behalf because this is what's driving me. Here it goes. Let me say what's driving me. This is what drives me. I want your hearts to be encouraged, being knit together in love. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot to be worked up over. (laughs) Except as we read on in a second, you realize that this really is a battle for their minds. He's he's not just saying in a mamby-pamby kind of way, I'm struggling on your behalf because, oh, I want your hearts to be knit together in love. No. The, The question that comes to our mind is, what is separating them? What is not knitting their hearts together in love? What what is pulling them apart? And it really is this battle for the mind. So this word up here, encouraged, really, really great word. It, it, it's this word that looks a lot like the word for the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the parakleo, but this is parakleo. It means to call someone near. And so when you encourage someone, which is Paul, what Paul wants them to be, encouraged, you literally call someone near. It's if you're kind of in a disturbed state <coughs> and you want some <coughs> someone to bring comfort to you, <coughs> excuse me, bring comfort to you and to make things better, you call, hey, can you come near? Someone comes near. 
and you're encouraged. So what he's saying metaphorically is what I'm going to speak to you right now is as though you are calling me near and I'm going to encourage you. But something is riling them. See, this is what we have to guess. What is riling them? What is working them up? What is it they need to be encouraged about? For instance, if he said, Epaphroditus came and visited me and he told me how much you're persecuted. I want you to be encouraged in the midst of your persecution. Well, that wasn't part of Epaphroditus' messages, but it would fit because instantly when someone needs to be encouraged, your question ought to be, what's discouraging them? Well, it's this doctrine that's at a battle for their minds, which is causing division at Colossae. So what was discouraging them? What was causing their love not to be manifest? What was, what was separating them? It seems as though there's a conflict going on, and that's the result. And now he's going he's gonna to work like an athlete to try and correct these problems so that the result will be they'll be encouraged and their hearts will be knit together in love. Now, this, if that's, that's a supposition. That is the doctrinal friction that's going on that's causing this division. Again, that's what the whole rest of the chapter is about is the doctrinal friction where things are wrong. And I ask myself, in the modern church, do we get all worked up against each other because of doctrinal differences? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess we do. <laughs> and many of those differences don't make any difference. I mean, they're really not that important. We get really worked up over that kind of stuff. We, we were talking about one earlier in the adult Sunday school class, talking about the English Bibles and the King James Bible. There's a, there's a lot of debate about whether the King James Bible is the only real authoritative English translation, all the rest are bad. That, that gets worked up into a froth and people start pounding each other verbally about what's right and wrong, about which English Bible you're supposed to use. In the end, that particular conflict I don't think is worth the time of day, really. I mean, uh, for me, if you're reading a Bible, including the King James, more power to you. I want you to read the Bible. But we do end up taking these, these topics, some of them of very lesser value, some of them of greater value, and it causes the unity in the distributed body of Christ to fall apart. And that's what he's talking about. That's what he's seeing here. I want you to be encouraged in the midst of this conflict. I want your hearts to be united in love. And many times when we have these disagreements over doctrine, that's what tears us apart. Now, I'll put a caveat on that. Some of these doctrinal differences are important enough to disunite over. <laughs> Some of them are heresy. But it's where you draw the line between the things that matter and the things that don't matter. That, I think that's where it's really important. And in Paul's case with the people in Colossae, it looks very clear based on how you can deduce what comes up that they were being torn apart by issues, doctrinal differences that are important to clarify. Really important. So that's why he's going to spend the whole chapter talking about it. So that's what we're talking about. We think that's what was discouraging him. So what's coming up here isn't just an educational treatise on what's true. It's really the bottom line is that once you get your head straight about truth, it'll cause your hearts to be encouraged and knit together in love because they won't separate you anymore. Okay, so let's see what he's going to work on. He says, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to reach all to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So this is his big kind of conclusion at the beginning of talking about the specifics. And the conclusion is, we want you to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. We want you to know what's going on, as opposed to, remember the Gnostics? They had this hierarchy of, I know something you don't know, and that made people more... He's saying, no, that's not what we want. We want to get you everything. The full and because of this full knowledge, you can be assured. Assured of what? Assured of who Christ is, assured of what your destiny is in Christ. So he, he's going to get that all squared away. You'll be assured of that. And what's the central topic? And this comes, you can prove it for the rest of the chapter. Christ, the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he uses this hidden and treasures kind of thing. It sounds like secret knowledge, like Gnostics. It's the hidden treasures. I have the treasure, you don't. No, it's not that at all. He's, what he's saying is that in Christ are all the answers. So, you know, if you're going to go digging around for the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, you don't have to dig outside of where Christ is. Christ is actually all of that. So he really is hitting against the Gnostics who claim this special knowledge. And Paul's saying, hey, if you want all the knowledge, even if it's slightly hidden, you don't know it just yet, it's very simple. Go to Christ. Christ has it, and we want you to have a full understanding of this knowledge. We're not, we're not keeping anything secret, but it may be hidden for a while. It made me, it made me think of this, 
this verse right here, when Jesus talks this parable, Matthew 13, 44, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Well, is the treasure inaccessible? No. But, it, but it'll cost him everything in that, in that sense. He trades everything for it. So in that parable, it says it's hidden in the field because it's, well, it's buried. It's not sitting on the surface. So he's using the same, Paul's using the same idea here. All wisdom and knowledge that you want to know about, that the Gnostics berate you for not having, they're in a field called Jesus. And if you dig there, you'll find all knowledge, all wisdom. It's not inaccessible. That's where it is. That's where, that's where he tells you to dig. Dig in Christ. And then you'll find all knowledge, all wisdom. And you know what? It makes sense. If Jesus is indeed fully man and fully God, which he is, if he is fully God creator, which Paul already told us in Colossians 1, he is, and the creator of the entire universe elects to come and fully indwell in a man, which he did, don't you think you'd go there for everything? We do. Hey, it sounds like that song all of a sudden. <laughs> so that's all he's talking about. Just go to Christ. That's, that's where you find these incredible treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's what I want to get straight in your head. That's why I'm doing it. So your hearts will be encouraged to be knit together. And he says, we have this opposing fight that's going on. Don't be naive. There is a battle for your mind that's fighting for you to believe the wrong things in terms of knowledge and wisdom. And you got to beware. Here's that fight, he says in verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Oh, there goes one. Oh, there it's back again. I don't want you to be deluded with plausible arguments. And he says this really well as a guy who understands Greek logic and deduction. He's saying, people will come into town and they'll understand who you are in Christ and they'll come up with some pretty good arguments. They're plausible. These are good arguments. These aren't just stupid arguments. They don't just come up to you and say, Jesus, oh, he's stupid. No, these are actually plausible arguments. And you listen to those arguments, you go, hmm, I think you might be onto something there. That's plausible. But what they're actually doing is they're deluding you. They're deluding you. So he says, what I'm writing right here, although it wants to, I want it to result in your hearts being knit together in love and being encouraged, what we have to do is get straight that in Christ are all the answers and everything else is going to be a delusion, even though in your logical, reasonable mind, it looks like it makes sense. Okay. Religious reasoning that never touches on Jesus usually leads you away from Jesus. And that's the plausibility of the argument. Now, we're not saying that plausibility and reason are wrong. Reason is not wrong. We're not saying that logic is wrong. All we're saying that is in this fight, which is a battle for your mind, the battleground, the turf, the astroturf of this, this battle is going to be reasoning using facts. So he's saying what you need to do is make sure that you keep your secret weapon right on the front. Jesus is your secret weapon. In him is all knowledge and wisdom. And the other stuff that comes on this playing ground, the astroturf of this battle for your mind, is going to be logic and reason and usually not fact but fiction. So you, you just got to be aware. You got to you be in gear. Now, it, the reason I say that reason and logic is not bad is because Paul's now going to give us facts that he wants you to engage your reason and logic with. So he's not, he will not write in the next sentence, this is true, why? Well, because I said so. He's not going to do that. That's not reasoning and logic. He's going to, get, he's going to lay it all out for it. He <laughs> wants you to think. Psalm 32, one of my favorite psalms says, God says, I want you to understand what's going on. I don't want you, for instance, to be like a mule where a mule will only go left or right if you pull on the reins. Oh, go right, oh, go left. And, and he says, God does not want that with you. He says right after that, he wants you to understand. He doesn't want you to be dumb as a mule. He wants you to understand. Reason and logic are okay. They're capacities that ga God gave us. But watch out. That's the battleground. Reason and logic is the battleground. And we want you to engage with the facts in this reasoning. Okay? So he'll go on and talk about it. He's going to introduce the topics. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So again, this is the rome Colossi separation. He's, yeah! He's agoning for them, but he can't get near them because we're all separated. 
but I, well, we're still going to have, I'm still going to be on your behalf. So literally says, you know, we are separated physically, but I'm with you in spirit. I, I'm, I'm there. I want you. And don't, don't interpret that farther than what it is. It's just like the same way we use it. He's with them trying to shore them up so that this is not a clear and present danger to their salvation. So, so he's saying, I, 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 that's what I'm doing. And you know what? Based on what Epaphroditus would tell him, or Epaphras, he's rejoicing to see the good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So, so far, it's been good. So far, you guys have held up. And he uses two, metaf- two military metaphor words right here, which are just awesome. I, I, I have to find a picture for this, and I finally found a picture. I was so happy. This, these right here, good order and firmness, those are military terms. Good order, all I have to do is show you the picture, and you know what that means. That's good order. It's ex- I mean, literally, the military use of the word is exactly that. You form up a rank and a file, and, and because you're together in this orderly fashion, you present a coordinated defense against the enemy. That, by the way, that's called the turtle formation. Can you see why? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's what he's saying. Up till now, this battle for your mind, you all have been in good order. You've presented a coordinated, interactive defense against the attacks for the battle for your mind. Good for you. Excellent. So that's one word he uses. The other word he uses down here is firmness. I couldn't find a military picture, but that's a good construction picture. (laughs) Okay, concrete is worthless when it's wet. But you're hoping that it'll dry and firm up. (laughs) So this word he uses is this idea of something that was not firm, which is now firm. It's firm. It's a military term because it actually applies to the turtle formation. From a defensive posture, the turtle formation, the good order you see in the upper right there, it's firm. So those are two military words he's using. The good order leads to a firmness instead of a squishiness in the battle for your mind. In other places uh, in the New Testament, it'll say this battle for your mind is like a, you know, don't be like waves tossed back and forth. You know, you, you can't be squishy. You got to be firm and in good order. So this is actually the whole idea of taking solid facts Coupling them together with good reasoning and good logic and then standing on them and being firm. So great military stuff. So Paul's saying, I'm frustrated because I'm so far from you, but up till now, I've heard good reports. You've been in good order and you've been firm. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. And then he goes on and starts to introduce the real ongoing focus that you need to do in the midst of this battle. What do I do every single day? So verse 6, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, very famous, so walk in it. That's, that's a commandment for daily life, every day. So as you receive Jesus Christ, and in other translations, as Lord or the Lord, well, then you walk in him. Daily you walk in him. So the whole idea right there of Lord is really dominating in this particular sentence because uh, Lord, Lord, you know, Lord in the Greek is this, is this kurios word. It, it literally, our best English translation is boss. Who's in charge here? And that's what you say when you go, who's in charge here? Who's the boss here? Who's the highest authority? That's what kurios means. That's what Lord means. So every time you see the word Lord, it isn't just a vacuous adjective about Jesus. It's speaking to the fact that he is the authority. He's, he's the top. He's, he's, the, he's the authority. Who's in charge here? Jesus is. That's what he's saying. So what he's saying, if you, if you keep that in the front of your mind, you know, in the same way that you, you received, in the Greek it actually means to pull alongside, that you received Christ Jesus as the boss, as the supreme authority in your life. Because that's what that word receives means. It means to, it's, it's parallel and bottom. It means to, bring, to take alongside. Just as you did that one day, you became a believer that way and a follower. You need to do that every day. It would, be just, it would be just as ridiculous as if I told Dorothy, we got married one day, August 28th, 1976. <laughs> I was just testing. We got married that day, and on that day I received her to myself, which is that word right there. Wouldn't it be ludicrous if that afternoon after the wedding was done, I said, well, bye, that was really fun. I'm, I'm glad we got our names on that marriage certificate. I'm just going to live my life now, separate from you. 
That's just ludicrous. So what Paul is saying, you started this thing with Jesus. You need to continue in Jesus. That, that is the preventative to the battle for your mind, is to continue to stay in Jesus. So, yeah, I mean, this is like, this is probably in the top five most important verses, I think, in the New Testament. If you gave your life to Christ and allowed him to become the boss, the Lord of your life, well, then that should be true tomorrow as well. And in that, that is the preventative from the battle of your mind, for the battle of your mind, is to walk in him. So this, this whole word walk is what that means. Oh, I was going to illustrate Lord. He uses it later in chapter 4. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. That master word? Kyrios. It's the same word for boss. So, so that's what he's saying. You, you started putting Jesus first as the boss, as the authority in your life, so you need to do that tomorrow, too. You need to do it all over. And, it, and if you're like me, which I think most of you are, you have a tendency to wake up from day to day and you switch who the boss is. I might have gone to bed with Jesus being my boss, but I, when, I, when I woke up in the morning, I'm the boss. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a natural thing to do. That's what your life before Christ was like. There, there really is a discipline issue right here where you have to wake up in the morning and say, well, Lord, yesterday was yours and the day before that, today, today's yours too. What do you want today? You know, what do you want of me today? What is it all about today? So there really is an issue of giving over to the boss the next day. And that's the idea of walking because walking is a metaphor for what you do day to day, what you do every day, in every place that you go. It's, it's routinely what you do. You need to walk in him. So that first decision you made to make him Lord is the same decision you make every day and reinforce it every single day. That's, a, that's just a huge deal. Now, previous to this chapter, he said the operating issue is Christ is in you. You don't wake up every morning trying to imitate Christ. You wake up every morning allowing him to live through you. A, a radically different thing. It's a radically different thing because the living Christ is here and is delighted to live in and through you. That, that's the whole deal. But as soon as you wake up in the morning and say, I'm in charge today, as a gentleman, he kind of steps aside and says, well, okay, tell me how that works out for you. Because <laughs> he does. He won't force himself that way. And then many times uh, he uses your circumstances that go south <laughs> After that, <laughs> I know everyone's nervously laughing. And you get to, and then think to yourself, and you think, oh, what was I thinking? I, I thought I was on top of things. I thought I was in charge of things. And then you realize, I probably should have given today to Jesus, and that may not have happened. That's not a guarantee that circumstances won't go south. They often do, even when you let Jesus be Lord. But when you mess up things because you took over, it's pretty obvious that was you. <laughs> yes okay so that's all he's saying right here is that you you folks in Colossae, good for you you came to christ made him boss in your life made him lord in your life the master of your life good for you so here's my tip of the day before i finish this chapter and talk about the battle you just need to stay in him and walk in him every day and everything you do that'll be such a huge preventative to a lot of what's going to happen coming up next just huge so if you made him lord yesterday make him lord today and then he uses this preposition, in. Now I was thinking, if I was writing the Bible, which you know is always a bad deal, <laughs> I would probably use these words instead. So walk toward Jesus every day. Yeah, that sounds, sounds good. You need to walk with Jesus every day. You need to walk for Jesus every day. All, all not bad, you know, sentiments, really. They're not bad. But Paul, in his agony, in his cell, is working on just the right word. You need to walk in Jesus. Radically different again. So here we have this idea, this reciprocal idea, that not only is Christ in you, but you have to be in him. Crazy talk? Not if you read John's Gospel and you read the prayer that Jesus does. You read 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's exactly what Jesus is praying for us. So he prays his Father that they might be in me and I in them and them in us and in, 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 in. It's a totality of experience. Is what it's. it's a shared experience in him. So he picks exactly the right word. If he said you need to walk toward Jesus, it would sound like the job tomorrow is to imitate Jesus in a way or something 
or walk for Jesus, that sounds imitative. But when he says in, he's talking about the immersive experience of living life in Christ with Christ in you. By the way, that's why baptism is such a great visual metaphor for being a Christian, for following Jesus. Baptism is about being dropped in something much bigger than you. <laughs> that's it. That's the picture. And so that's what we're saying. You are, are you dropping yourself totally into him? And is he totally in you? Again, the, the in you reciprocal part's interesting in baptism too because uh, when we talk about the spirit, we are, the spirit is here and it's, it's around us, but it's also in us. Uh, and in the Old Testament and New Testament, the spirit, they use the same word that's connected to air. Well, in the same way that you're sitting in air right now, the air is also in you. Yeah. So you're in the air, and the air is in you. The spirit's in you, uh, you're in the spirit here. You're in Christ, Christ is in you. So that, that's, not a, that's not just an accidental metaphor. That's exactly what it is. When you come to Christ, you're placed into something much bigger than you, and he fills you as well. So that's, that's kind of cool. Okay, that's wrong. Instead, well, he follows us up, and he says you need to be rooted and built up in him. And that's what, this, that's what this routine walking in Christ does, is it continues to root you deeper into him, and it continues for your life to be built upon him and nothing else. Uh, again, great visual metaphors right here. One of them's organic, and uh, one of them's uh, foundation. We'll get to that in just a second. The first organic one right there is a plant. <laughs> you need to be rooted in a plant. You need to be rooted in something as a plant, right? You don't as a plant pull your roots out of the pot and just go walking down the street. Because when you do that, there's no source of nutrients nor a place that you can grow. So the metaphor is very exact right here. You pull your roots out of Jesus, you're a sitting duck or you're a walking root. <laughs> and, and, you know, we have lots of plants around our house that get pulled out of their pots and they die real fast. Yeah, so that's what he's saying. You need to be rooted. That's what this walk will do. It'll root you. It'll also, from a, from a construction perspective, it'll build you up. This word built up actually means to build on a foundation. Right? And we've seen this foundation before. There's something that's common about both of these metaphors, one construction and one organic. And what's common about them is for you to thrive and to live, you got to stay put. In the plant case, stay, stay put in the planter. On the foundation, if you're going to build, stay put on the foundation and build up from that. So it's really an appeal from two different metaphorical pictures for you to stay put where you were to start with. If you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's the appeal he's making. Stay put where Jesus is. That's how you started. That's how you should do it tomorrow. Stay put right there. And you'll be rooted and grounded and built up in him. And as a result, you'll be established in the faith. And this is how you get firm. Remember he talked about being firm? This is how you get firm in the faith by staying in Christ and determining to walk in him every day. It's not just a marriage ceremony where you signed a document years ago and then you walk away from him. When that happens, catastrophe follows. <laughs> walk in him. Stay in him. That's what this is all about. Stay put. Grow, build in him. That's key. And this is as a result of what you were taught and abound in thanksgiving. So what you originally taught about Christ, which God used to lead you to himself, stay with that. Don't, don't go whacked out entertaining other paths and other stuff. You know? If you start off in Christ, continue in Christ, and also be thankful for the fact that you've got all wisdom and all knowledge. You're, you're there. You've got what you've always hankered for all your life in Christ. Be thankful for that. As opposed to saying, well, maybe I've got it all wrong. These guys came in with a pretty plausible argument the other day. No. Be thankful for where he's brought you because you've got, you just won the lottery in terms of wisdom and knowledge and salvation. You've got it all. So be thankful for that. Don't just mess around. So this really, this is the end of his intro to his very practical advice, which comes up for the rest of the chapter about what the battle for the mind looks like. But, but before we leave this, and we'll come back to this next week, this whole battle for the mind, it's, it's super duper important. What you believe is the foundation because God wants you to understand. Let me just illustrate the fact that we do indeed have an opponent who's, uh, who's out to make you think the wrong thing. And in trying to make you think the wrong thing, he will use the avenue of your reason and logic. And he'll bring to you arguments that, doggone, they seem pretty darn plausible.
But you've got to be careful. Here's, here's what the opponent is. Jesus is talking in John 8, talking to the Pharisees. He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Now, if you were the devil and you wanted to take down the believers of Christ, I would think the best approach would be to do really scary horror movie kind of things in the dark when you're sleeping, right? Or something really powerful, something like, like ooh, do really crazy stuff. You would, I would think that would be where the battleground would be because these Christians are so weak and timid. You know, if I just show up at the foot of their bed with red horns and stuff, I would just freak out. And, uh, but, but the devil's, the devil's weapon is lies. Now that should tell you something about the importance of the battle for your mind. Because he wants you to understand something and embrace something that's not true. And usually about who Christ is. That, that, is, that, is, that is his selected weapon of choice. You know, when you, play, when you play video games online and you usually shoot them up games and stuff, you usually have multiple weapons you can use in different circumstances. Not that I actually play these games. <laughs> but when you see a big opponent coming, usually you usually reach down for your biggest weapon, right? This one will, this will take them out. <laughs> the devil's weapon is lie. That should tell you something about the importance of the battle for your mind because he's going to try and take you out by lying. Now, what does he accomplish when he lies to you? He gets you to believe a falsehood and then with your cooperation, with your cooperation, willingly destroy yourself. With your cooperation. That's what a lie does. That's why lying is so bad in that particular sense. And, and Jesus doesn't say that, that the devil has a little bit of truth. <laughs> he says he's got no truth. There's, there's nothing he speaks that isn't a lie. Falsehoods. So to the degree to which you will believe falsehoods, you can be derailed from following Jesus. Really? Well, how am I supposed to defend against that? Well, you can't. But with the Holy Spirit, you can. And with that book in your hands, you can. So that's, that's why it's really important that you don't stray too far from that book in your hands. I mean, you need to completely wash your thinking with it. It's a source of truth. It corrects plausible arguments. And then the Holy Spirit helps us in it. I'll show you that in just a second. Here's what Genesis, here's a good demonstration of Satan really doing this. Genesis 3, we're looking at Eve and the serpent. But the serpent said to the woman, Oh, you will surely, you'll surely not die. God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Eat the apple and you'll die. No, you won't die. It's just that God doesn't want you to be like him. Mm, too bad. Because then you'll know good and evil and that'll be good for you. No, this is a lie. <laughs> this is a lie. This is a total lie. And, and we, we first see Satan doing this in Genesis 3, and he does it through the rest of the Bible. And what he often does is he says, did God really say that? No, he didn't. No, no, no. What he's, what he's doing is he's denigrating the truthfulness of God himself. And that's what he'll do in everything you read that comes out of Jesus' mouth. Did Jesus really say that? No, he, did he? No, really? No, no. He, God just doesn't want you to advance to the level that he's at. So Satan is really good at this. He's really good at this. In fact, he's so good at this, he's better at this than you are able to defend yourself with reason. I just got to tell you, you're a sitting duck in that realm. But if you wash your thinking with the truth that's in the word, if you wash your thinking with who Jesus is, if you appeal to God and say, God, your spirit's here, I need you, this look, make, looks like it makes sense, but I'm not sure, then you're really not a sitting duck. And Paul's, Paul's celebrating the fact that those guys weren't either. Because look, here's our secret weapon. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Yes! So you aren't really a sitting duck. You have, you have God's Spirit inside of you, which will bring you into all truth. You have this word that's put in front of you. It's meant for you to understand it for that very purpose as well. Coupled with the Holy Spirit, you're not sitting ducks. But don't forget plausible, reasonable arguments will come up on shore in your life all the time and they'll threaten until you say, well, I don't think that's biblical. 
So you got to think biblically. Here's another place down here, John 16. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. <sighs> Thank God. Really. I mean, really. Because this place is full of the most notorious, plausible lies going. And, and they're very clever. And they, will, and they will put you down if you don't appeal to where truth comes from in the word and through Christ and illuminated to the Holy Spirit. That's just a really big deal. Because Jesus prayed this in John 16, if you're ever in a situation where you feel like there's a battle for your mind going on right now based on a topic that's washed ashore in your life and, it's, and you're sitting right there saying, well, it looks pretty plausible and you don't know how to untie it, but something, your spidey senses are going, something's wrong with this, something's wrong with this, I don't know what, something's wrong with this. I get that all the time, basically. I, I can't pin it down immediately, but I'm going, uh, right? Uh, I, I got one this week. Got a letter from a lady from Logan saying the end of the world was coming last Tuesday and Wednesday. Well, I, I knew how to refute that one. So we went camping just in case the place got nuked. We'd be up in... <laughs> we did. We were, we were actually up in Logan Canyon for those two days, you know, waiting for the flash to come up the valley, but... It didn't happen. But you, you know what I'm saying? If, if you ever get to that place where this, these things are something you're going, you know, it's not quite something right, right? Then I do this all the time. I say, God, I don't know what's wrong with this. But I need to get your understanding. You promised me a fullness of knowledge and wisdom. And I know this comes through the Holy Spirit, which is resident inside me. And you gave me your word. You need to lead me through this because I'm a sitting duck trying to untangle this. I really am. And you will be a sitting duck too if you just rely on yourself. So just pray. And because of this promise, God will come to your rescue and help you untangle it. With truth, with truth. That's the battle for your mind is to substitute truth with falsehood. So we are going to finish with this song right here. And because, I, we, I wanted to bring this song back, is because throughout the entire New Testament and into Revelation, there is really one central discussion. And it's who Jesus is. Not only in the battle for your mind, but where salvation comes from. And even throughout the entire narrative and Revelation, it's the lamb who appears as always been slain. I mean, he's central to the entire thing. Ladies, when you just did your study on Revelation, you did the study looking for the lamb throughout the entire part of Revelation. You didn't spend 10 weeks talking about what 666 means, did you? No, okay, you didn't. Okay, good. <laughs> just, just checking. I don't know. I mean, you may, the whole idea, which is the right way to look at Revelation, is to look for the lamb, look for Jesus, the lamb that was slain. He's the central figure He's the center of the entire narrative and revelation throughout all the Gospels, throughout the early church and Acts and through Paul's letters. He's the discussion topic all the way through the Old Testament as the coming Messiah King. He's the center of it all. So when we come to Revelation, there we are at the throne. And like we sang in the new song today, you know, worthy. He is, is anyone worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? Jesus is. So that's the easy preventative start to Paul's discussion about the battle for your mind. Just routinely keep Jesus in the center of your focus in everything you do. It's just a very big deal because if the creator of the universe visited in human form, I think I would start with him on all these issues. By the way, too, to give you a sneak peek, next week and the week, week after that, he is going to get so concrete. He's going to solve for you the problem of what day is the Sabbath and whether it matters and what foods we should and shouldn't eat. Yes. <laughs> so he'll address that and, you know, what holidays we ought to celebrate. I mean, it gets pretty practical. So if you're curious, you can read ahead. Just don't spoil alert for the rest of us next week. But it's, it's very practical. Very practical. Really practical. Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word that does bring us truth, that that gives us a foundation we can stand on and put our roots down into and through your spirit to gain understanding and full knowledge of what your intent for us is and what's true and what's false. Lord, we admit we live in a place that's full of swirling lies. They just seem to swirl around like the falling leaves off the trees right now. They're just swirling every place. And Lord, they confuse us and, and we don't know how to hand them. But Lord, we want to engage those lies. We want to understand what's wrong with those lies. But we are so desperately in need of your truth and of your spirit to give us understanding. And you do. 
And Lord, like Paul, we are thankful for the fact that you and you alone are the one who've caused us to become in good order in rank and file. You and you alone are the one that has firmed us up in this truth and not left us squishy like wet concrete. You're the one that's done that. You're the one who comes alongside, who brings encouragement, who knits our hearts together as we settle and rest in the assurance of your truth. So we thank you for that in this very crazy place we live right now. And we thank you that you are so committed to us understanding. And as you bring us understanding and knowledge and wisdom, we are amazed at who you are and what you've done in our life. So thank you for the bedrock solidness of your truth in our lives. And we thank you for your spirit that gives us that understanding now. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this. Amen.